Welcome everybody to the fifth event of this year's Stories to Share. And everybody should look down. We are breaking in the new floor. I, uh, I want to acknowledge our sponsors, Bell Tets and the Savings Bank of Walpole and reintroduce myself. I am Joe Steinfield, and I am the moderator of Stories to Share. How many of you are here for the first time for this particular uh, event? A few. Well, welcome, and thank the rest of you for coming back. As you know, uh, we feature speakers from the Monadnock region exclusively and today's speaker uh, has been a resident of Dublin for many years, but that's only the beginning. From the age of two, he spent his summers in New Ipswich in sleeping in army surplus tents. <laughs> now, I'm not sure how many years ago that is, but his family traces its roots in this region back to the 1780s. Anybody here beat that? <laughs> ah, yes, good. Yes, you have some company, Dick. Dick Ober is the president and CEO of the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, which is a major grant-giving and scholarship-giving organization the largest one in northern New England, uh, handling something over a billion dollars and uh, giving grants, I believe, in excess of $60 million annually. So it's a big deal. Dick has a lifetime of public service, uh, both in the area of conservation and for the last 15 years heading up the Charitable Foundation. And I asked him, and he graciously agreed to speak, uh, because it seems to me, and I believe you would all agree, that what this foundation does is an incredibly important part of our state. And he, after 15 years in this position, has built what was already a vibrant organization into an even more vibrant one. And the name of Dick's speech is The Power of Place, kind of an interesting title. I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dick Ober. Thank you very much, Joe. I really appreciate being invited to do this tonight and I want to also thank Ed for the wonderful work on the technology. I have to say, to be a part of this lineup of speakers with some people that I have known in many cases for 30 or 40 years and who in many ways kind of define what it's like to live in our region, it's really been an honor to be a part of that. I'm going to mention a few of them in the course of my remarks tonight. So three things have shaped my life, probably much like yours. Um, starts with the people, my family and my friends and the colleagues and the people I've met through my career. This place, um, and when I think about my place, I think of northern New England and then I come down to New Hampshire and then I come down to the Monadnock region as home. And then my career which as Joe said in those uh, very gracious remarks, has centered around land conservation and philanthropy um, and work with nonprofits, but I've also had a side career in writing. So I'm gonna actually tell some stories that weave those three things together, but with this common theme about the power of place and how place shapes who we are, how we shape place um, for good, for ill sometimes. 
this is going to be, I'm going to weave in a little bit about my writing. I'm going to read a couple of things near the end, but mostly it's going to be about this profound role that nonprofit organizations play in the lives of the Monadnock region and more broadly in New Hampshire. So I'm going to start with two points. So first, like, why focus on nonprofit organizations? We live in a state that thrives on community-based action and frankly, kind of decentralized decision-making. The role of nonprofits in New Hampshire is probably outsized versus almost every other state in the union. It's been part of the way that we kind of do life in New Hampshire for a long time. Um, every family in New Hampshire is touched by a nonprofit organization every day. And I can say that with some confidence, having spent 40 years in this, in this field. Second, why the title power of place? The word power really has multiple meanings. I'm going to play with that a little bit. Um, place shapes who we are. It has the power to kind of shape the rhythm of our lives, the air we breathe, the recreation that we pursue, social patterns, spirituality. But power also can inspire and motivate positive action. I'm going to give some examples. But there's also a twist on the word power. And I'm going to ask you to think about this a little bit at the end of my remarks. Who decides what happens to the places that we love and we call home? How do we balance private and public rights and responsibilities for the lands that are around us and the places that we share? What voices are excluded? as we make decisions about our future. So I'm going to ask you to think about a little, little bit about that. I'm going to start, though, um, with this place. So um, this is your regular old 100 acres of land in New Ipswich. It's what a mentor of mine used to call kind of the land that holds New Hampshire together. Nothing remarkable about it. Um, it's got some woods and some, and whoa, I just went forward. Sorry about that. So it has woods and it has a field and it has a pond and it has an outhouse. Um, this piece of land has been in my family since the 1860s. And as Joe said, starting from when I was two, and at the time my family was living in the Midwest, um, my father was a school teacher and a school principal, every single summer, my parents would pile the four of us into a, into a station wagon. I was two, my sisters were five and seven, and my brother was nine. Drive across the country, set up camp every single night. This is 1962. Set up camp every night, um, eat dinner off of a camp stove, a pup tent, a little trailer, I'll have breakfast in the morning, drive another 500 miles, do that again, all to come to New Ipswich, where we would then camp for six weeks, a mile from the nearest paved road or electricity. At the time, I thought, okay, this is what everyone does. There's nothing unusual. <laughs> and I, I think of it now, we have one daughter, when she was two or three, you know, going out for a picnic would take four hours of planning, and they just, this is what we did. So, um, it kind of took, so my father on the right there inherited this land from his grandmother, Sarah Jenkins, uh, he spent time on this property as a boy. Um, that's my wife Liz and our daughter Daisy when she was an infant. Um, she's been up there since she was born. And so there between my uh, great grandparents and what you see in this picture are five generations. There's been a tradition on this family of... Ed, you might, there we are. Um, frog catching, of course, um, as I did. That's my daughter when she was 15 or 16 um, doing that. We, and we are now on this piece of property into the sixth generation. That's my great niece, Seraph Serafina Marte, um, with Daisy in the field camping as we did um, 60 years ago now. So that experience really took for me, and in many ways, that's what led to the first two-thirds of my career, which was in land conservation. 
So starting in 1985, first with the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests and then with the Monadnock Conservancy, I had the, the pleasure of, of being involved in hundreds and hundreds of land conservation projects, uh, collectively conserving hundreds of thousands of acres um, in the state. Through conservation easements, throughout right acquisition for conservation areas, um, expanding state parks, expanding uh, the national forest, and obviously when we think about these lands that we value so much, it's forests and it's fields and it's lakes and river shorelines and mountains. The last seven years of my career in land conservation um, until 2001 was as the director of the Monadnock Conservancy. Um, and I was thinking about this talk and there's so many stories. I was involved in probably 100 land conservation projects here and Thinking about Jaffrey and people like Forrest Ames, who um, had a remarkable piece of land, and I used to sit and, and he would tell me stories. I was thinking about some work we did with the Conservation Commission and a select board around some town forests, um, conservation of Frost Pond. And of course, every piece of land here has a story behind it and has people behind it. I have to name a few of those, um, and you'll recognize some of these. Diane Schott was a dear friend and a mentor for many years. I know some of you knew Diane and John. Betsy Harris from Dublin, the founder of the Monadnock Conservancy. Gina Goff, who's with us tonight on the board of the Conservancy at the time. Tom Hanna, and I'll end with the current director of the Conservancy, Ryan Owens. So I'm using these names because that connection and how we express our love and our commitment to place through land conservation was just a huge part of my life. Um, this takes us way, way up north. Um, this is in the northern edge of New Hampshire. Um, in the mid-1990s, my friend David on the left there and I wrote a book called The Northern Forest where we're exploring the future the past, present, and future land use trends of the 26 million acre Great Northern Forest that stretches from uh, Maine across northern New England, northern New Hampshire and Vermont to upstate New York. And the fellow on the right there, uh, we went back to see him a couple of years ago, is one of several people that we featured. And we are trying to explore how changes in land use, in this case, the closing of the paper mills, deep changes in the forest products industry. How are people in those communities responding to these changes? And this fellow was a, uh, just a wonderful, colorful guy, um, paper mill worker and logger uh, from Berlin. And I share that because this was part of my writing life. Um, I've had this side career. I actually studied journalism and was a journal journalist briefly before going into nonprofits. And, have written a fair amount and uh, some books and some book chapters and magazines and, and so forth. And the, my, my interest was always this connection between, you won't be surprised, people and place. And the more I wrote and the more I read, <laughs> as much as I loved being in land conservation, by around 2001, after almost 20 years of working in land conservation, I'm sorry, 2007, I, I realized that there are many other ways that people were connecting with the places they loved and many other issues facing this place that I love so much, New Hampshire, the Monadnock region, but the broader state of New Hampshire. And so I, in 2000, there we are. Ed, you might need to press that. There we are. So in 2008, I went to work at the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. Um, and a wonderful summary from Ed, so I'll cover a little bit more of that. Partly because there was such a broader set of issues that I was becoming increasingly passionate about, health and equal access to health and climate change and what it was doing with uh, big weather events and food insecurity. We live in a very prosperous state and as you know, thousands of our neighbors don't have enough to eat. Education and access especially to post-secondary education. 
was worried about some of the divisions that were happening in our society um, and the center picture there of some of the um, impacts of gun violence and homelessness and housing, which even when I started at the foundation 15 years ago was a problem and is a, is a bigger problem in the state now. Our foundation touches all of these issues and the way a community foundation works, which is what we are, and this is why this type of philanthropy appeals to me. One, it's place-based. So the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation was founded in 1962, hey, the year I started camping on that piece of land, I'm just realizing, <laughs> um, 1962 by and for the people of New Hampshire. So it's place-based. Second, our foundation covers all of these issues because they're all woven together. Um, the way our foundation works is we don't have one big fund. We're not the Gates Foundation or the Ford Foundation. We have 2,300 individual funds set up by 2,300 New Hampshire families and individuals, frankly, for 2,300 different reasons. And we grow that every year with lots of new funds. And out of those, as Joe said, we make grants to nonprofit organizations. We fund about 2,000 nonprofit organizations a year and scholarships for about 2,000 students. This work appeals to me because it brings together the extraordinary work of the nonprofit organizations that help hold our communities together and passionate donors who simply want to give back to make their places and their communities better. So I'm gonna go through a few stories about the work, some work that we've had the honor of funding in the Monadnock region. Um, this is a wonderful partnership between the Monadnock Conservancy, the, your local land trust, and the uh, Early Learning Center in Winchester, which is a primary childcare center, especially for lower income families. The Early Learning Center wanted a little bit of land where the kids could go out and experience nature, and the Conservancy wanted to conserve that same piece of land. So now, next door to the Early Learning Center, there is this piece of conservation land that is used regularly by the students at this, at this uh, center. Um, this is a great example of two quite different nonprofit organizations working together to achieve something both to advance their own missions, but also something to benefit the, the community of Winchester of the Harris Center. So the Harris Center, one of its many programs, is Harris Center for Conservation Education, headquartered in Hancock, is training citizen scientists, other words, all of us, volunteers, to go out and to monitor amphibians, and particularly to help amphibians cross the road safely during two or three nights in the spring where like 80% of the salamanders and wood frogs um, and other endangered amphibians have to pass. My wife and I do this every year. We go out there with our rain jackets and our flashlights and help several hundred amphibians. So, but what this is doing is it is a, it's combining science, people are learning, it's combining direct action of people who want to do something for these species, and it's a community event uh, where people get together to do it. Land for Good, this is an organization that's actually based in Keene, but it works all over New England. This happens to be a farm in Wilmot. And what Land for Good does is it, it's a matchmaker. So nonprofit organization that's recognized there's a lot of farmland out there that's not being used. There's a lot of farmers, often young farmers, who want to farm that don't own the land. So it matches them and creates, helps farmers lease uh, bits of farmland so then they can grow crops for local farmers markets, um, su community supported agriculture and so forth. Entrepreneurial, innovative, seeing a need and meeting it, um, that's the role of a, of a nonprofit like that. So that's something else we're proud to fund. Um, this is Avenue A, Avenue A in Antrim, which is the only regular, almost always open teen center in our region. It's sponsored by the Grapevine, which is a family resource center in Antrim. 300 teens from 18 towns um, come together at Avenue A. Um, and you know, 
we have a teenager, many of you have as well, children and grandchildren. It can be tough in these rural areas. Um, so nonprofit, they saw a piece, of, uh, they saw a need, they found a, piece, a building that needed some use, and now we have a teen center. We were, again, thrilled to be able to fund that. This is 100 Nights, which is a shelter in Keene. You've probably seen it over by the Monadnock Family Co-op, a food co-op, a beautiful new building. Um, there is a need for a shelter in Keene. One person started this 20 years ago, and since dozens and now hundreds of people have combined um, and supported this work for shelter for families who need it. Um, we invested in this one not only by making regular grants to 100 Nights, but also from our invested assets, we actually made a loan to this, made an investment in it, a half a million dollar investment. Um, we're getting that money back at a very low but a good return. So we're putting the underlying investments of our foundation to work to good in the community, even as we're also making grants to support the nonprofit. I've got just a few more slides, and um, I want to talk about where the money and the passion comes from for the, all this work. As I mentioned, 2,300 funds. I'm going to just list and name three um, and the donors behind them. So I like this proper, this shot here. So Amy Sandback um, owned a piece of land in Ringe, and she realized that she needed to sell it. She put a conservation easement on most of it. She carved out a house lot, and then she gave it to the New Hampshire Char Charitable Foundation. We sold it. 95% of the property was conserved. It was a priority for the Ringe Conservation Commission. And with the money, we put it into a fund to support her two great passions. One was the environment, and the second was arts and art education. Whoops. We're going too fast. Can you find where we were? There we are. Um, it's possible you saw this in the news in around Thanksgiving. It, this little bit of news from Hinsdale went viral globally. Um, this man, his name is Jeffrey Holt. A very, very humble man, had worked as a teacher, had worked in a local factory, had taught driver's ed, and most recently for the last 15 or 20 years was uh, uh, mowed lawns. Um, and he was also an extraordinary penny pincher and saver, and he spent almost no money. When he died, complete surprise to the people of Hinsdale, he left $3.8 million in a fund at the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation specifically to support nonprofits and the people they serve in his beloved place of Hinsdale. And when he started talking with his best friend about this, he just said, this place has been good to me and I can't imagine a better thing to do. Uh, and finally, this is, um, this is actually a little bit of homage to Cy Montgomery because these kids are actually in the library reading Cy's book. Um, but this was the two funds we have, one the Goyette Fund in Peterborough, great Peterborough family, the other Ewing Fund in Keene, great uh, Keene family. We've used those to fund libraries across the region for decades now to support programming, especially for um, young people and especially for kids who might not be having that kind of access in their lives. Um, so once again, the Goyettes and the Ewings left these funds to help strengthen those communities that, that they loved. And this, whoops. You can go back a couple, Ed. I'm going to close with this, by the way, so I'm glad you're looking at it. <laughs> Thank you. 
There we are. So I'm putting this partly as an homage to Mary Islin, who was here um, as, as your last speaker, an old friend. So there is an artist and a musician from Nelson, Albert Duval Quigley. Um, that's one of his paintings. You can see the mountain in the background, Mount Monadnock. And when he died, a group of local friends wanted to do something in his honor. They created a scholarship fund at the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation to support students who were pursuing art um, in their post-secondary education. So I'm going to leave that slide up for a few minutes here um, because I want, to, I want to transition into a few other ideas. And it starts with the power of art to celebrate and connect us to place. That is an entirely whole separate subject. Lots of people know more about it than I have. But I'd like you to think about, when you think about this place we call the Monadnock region, or that specific place that you call home, what are the books? What are the poems? What is the music um, that evokes for you what that means to you as a person who lives in and celebrates that place. So as you think of that, I want, you to, I want to share something with you. So this power of place to me is a very positive idea. It can inspire us to care for our community, as you've seen in those stories and hundreds of others. But power has other connotations when it comes to place. Who decides what our places should look like and how they should be used? I wrote about this in the book, Where the Mountain Stands Alone. You saw a picture of that before that was uh, edited by, um, uh, produced, let's see, in about 2006. Um, and it was edited by Howard Mansfield, uh, one again, one of the great storytellers in our region and husband of Cy Montgomery. Um, and I wrote an essay on the Monadnock land ethic. And I asked a question, is there a special ethic in the Monadnock region? And I thought about th that because the specific story I focused on is a story many of you know far better than I, and that's the Sawyer Farm. And what happened to the Sawyer Farm when the silo burned and all of you came together and, and rebuilt that for Peter and Ann Sawyer. And I was, uh, it's a long essay and it talks about the history of land use in the region and kind of how it's evolved and how our attitudes for land is involved. But there's this paragraph in here that I want to read to you about um, some of the tensions that place can create. So unintentionally, we sometimes find ourselves at odds with one another. The cash poor landowner who needs to sell timber so that they can hang on to his woodlot is then criticized by the ecologist who rightfully is worried about the potential impact of logging on habitat. The hikers blame hunters who share their passion for the outdoors for scaring them out of the woods in the fall. The new homeowner makes romantic photographs of the farm across the road, but then complains to the select board when ripe manure is spread to green up the fields. So these are the things we all live with, these tensions in rural New Hampshire. So the power of place, it can inspire, it can unite, it can sustain us, and that can also divide, reinforce our biases, be concentrated, that power can be concentrated into a smaller segment of the population based on culture, based on age, based on income. So this is the central purpose of the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. To make New Hampshire a more just, a more sustainable, and a vibrant community where everyone, everyone in our community can thrive. And that starts with asking who isn't thriving and why not? And what can we do as community members to help those of our neighbors who are not? It requires understanding difference. It requires understanding what it means to belong in a place like the Monadnock region. And it, it requires us to be welcoming uh, whenever we can. I'm going to wrap up with this on the um, slide. So 
I would encourage you to go to this event on March 22nd. This felt like such a good follow-up. Stories about this place. This is sponsored by the Monadnock Conservancy. The speaker is Ernie Hebert. I understand Ernie was here in a previous year. Who knows of the work of the novelist Ernie Hebert? So in, for my money, no one has ever quite been able to write fiction as genuinely as embedded in what life in rural New Hampshire is like. Ernie grew up in Keene. His first series of books, the Darby series, five novels all set in the Monadnock region. Um, he's a riot, he's funny, so if you have a chance to. And I, I mention Ernie because there are storytellers who are a whole lot better than I am on this. And there are artists and there are musicians who celebrate and ask us to think about the power of place. Um, one of the most remarkable things that's happened in the last couple of years, I think, is the production of the film, The Mountain That Stands Alone. And I see a lot of nods, premiered at the Park Theater last summer, and I'm closing today with two very brief quotes from that film. Um, because the mountain, it stands as the symbol of this place we call our home region, and it's a powerful symbol, it's a physical symbol, but the story of how the mountain was conserved by the people of the Monadnock region far much greater is actually a story of understanding difference, trying to work with finding the right balance um, on behalf of a beloved and sacred icon. So these two quotes. The first is from David Anderson, a friend of mine of 40 years who's featured in the film works at the Forest Society, and Dave just says, I would ask people when they climb the mountain to think about what our generation's time means. What is our responsibility to the mountain? What is our responsibility to a broader place? There's a power there. And then finally in the film, Dr. Robert Goodby says, he hopes we take from this film a holistic understanding of the region. Not just one piece of it, the mountain, but how all of the, these things are tied together and create out of that a common sense of what it means to live in this place. Thank you. I forgot to tell everybody to turn off their cell phones. <laughs> But it turns out I didn't need to, and I'm glad none went off because that was a mesmerizing, wonderful talk. And thank you so much. Now, uh, questions, including people online, and I should welcome those who are attending remotely. And uh, after that, we'll have our usual reception, just so I don't forget too many more things. I want to thank Edward Tazak, who always does a great job. And I want to thank Nancy Beltet and Jean Duval, who handled the treats at the reception following. So, who would like to? And I should say, Sean Driscoll, who is also on the show. <laughs> And Laura in the back. Okay, who wants to start? Don't be shy. I want to congratulate you for the staff that you have. Um, they don't spend all their time in uh, Concord. They definitely come to communities we have been the recipient here at the Civic Center of your staff just asking what are the needs in Jaffrey, and uh, it's, it's very appreciated. I can also say that our recent Martin Luther King Jaffrey Ridge celebration was sponsored by the Charitable Foundation to the tune of $1,000. We thank you for that. Thank you for saying that as, as a, we cover, every town in the state um, 
and we have staff, to your point, who live throughout the state. We have staff in the North Country, we have staff here, we have staff in the Seacoast, we have a central office in Concord. Um, but to do the kind of work we do, we have to be in the community to understand the needs. So thank you for saying that. Please stand up so we can hear you. Um, of the many challenges facing New Hampshire and the Monadnock region, what do you think, Dick, is the most important to solve? The most important challenge facing the region. Um, so I'm going to make this about New Hampshire, for, really, because it applies everywhere. And I'm going to answer it in two ways. I think the first is a more broad challenge, and that is to understand something I've long called the New Hampshire paradox. And here's what I mean by that. By every measure of quality of life, New Hampshire does really well. We're in the top 10 of virtually every index. So we are fifth or sixth uh, richest states in the country when it comes to per capita income. We are the safest state in the country. We are one of the healthiest states in the country. We're one of the best educated states in the country. But we have taken, I think, that for granted and have been over complacent because those are averages and we're not, have not focused enough on two things. How do we build long-term prosperity? And how do we recognize that there are tens of thousands of our neighbors who are not benefiting for that? So a couple of, here's the paradox. One of the richest states in the country per capita income. And we also have one of the greatest gaps when it comes to income inequality in the country. For a while, we had the fastest growing rate of childhood poverty in the, in the country. And this was strange, because we still have a very low overall childhood poverty rate. Very low. But it was growing faster than any state in the country except for Mississippi for three or four years. We are one of the best educated states in the country, but the, um, we have tremendous disparities in equities, school district to school district, based on the fact which districts have more taxable property and therefore can build the better schools and hire the best teachers and all of that. So we have many kids falling further than behind, even when average we're doing well. So I think the, the biggest kind of piece of this is to recognize that those averages, we can't be complacent about them and recognize there's real need, real gaps, um, and roll up our sleeves, nonprofit action, public action to solve those. I think the fundamental biggest problem we're facing in the state is housing. So for social issue, for health issues, housing comes first. Um, we have less than a 1% vacancy rate um, which means essentially there is no vacancy for rentals. This is for rentals. Um, we have a growing house, uh, homelessness crisis, and it's not just in Manchester and Nashua, it's everywhere. Um, there's a lot of good things happening, but that's something that happens because we believe in local land use and we believe in home control. That's something that we need both statewide solutions and local solutions for. Who's next? Yeah. Dick, um, David Delvey, um, how does the New Hampshire charities, do families approach you folks because they have uh, monies that they, they don't know how to uh, give it out, yeah. whatever, I mean, and, and do you, as an ordinance, you know, somebody comes in and says, uh, these are kind of the parameters we're thinking about, and do you guys take it from there? Okay. Or you get roughly, involved to a, to a Roughly, yes. Um, so the families who come to us, and it's not uh, necessarily super wealthy families, I want to be clear. We have retired school teachers coming to us. We have um, small business owners, and yes, we have families with significant wealth. And they come to us because they feel, they understand how important charitable giving is and how important nonprofits are. And they become a little overwhelmed by just 
there's so much out there and who should we give to. So we can provide philanthropic counsel for a family that says, I really care about social issues and I care about them in the Monadnock region. Can you help me sort out which nonprofits are doing what? So we can provide that level of philanthropic counsel. The way our business model works is the family might choose to establish a fund at the foundation and it actually operates as a little mini foundation but within our larger um, statewide foundation. The family can say, I really care about the environment. Grants will be made to nonprofits who care about the environment. Or I care about scholarship for kids from the Monadnock region. We can set up a scholarship for that. So it's a conversation to match the passions and the interests of the donors with the needs in the community. And in turn, we commit to fulfilling that charitable legacy forever. So we, in many cases, are in the third, fourth generation of making sure that the original donor's philanthropic legacy is being uh, kept to. If I may, I guess this is the power of being the moderator. <laughs> I know a little about what you just said because in about 1916, a man named Abe Satso came from Eastern Europe to Claremont. His son, Sammy, inherited his butcher shop. He was a butcher, maybe even a kosher butcher. Sammy's son, Michael, took it over and created the North Country Smokehouse in Claremont. And correct me if I'm wrong, but around the time you started heading up the foundation, he created the fund for Claremont. And if ever a place needs a fund, it's my hometown of Claremont. <laughs> but I'm interested in knowing uh, who decides and on what criteria where the money goes. Yeah, that's great. So we, this is community philanthropy. Um, I basically never decide on a grant that comes from the foundation. Out of 5,000 grants we made last year to 2,000 nonprofits, although I'm a voting member of our board of directors, very little influence. That's because where the money goes is the collective decisions of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. First, the Satsows in coming up with the idea of the Claremont Fund, inviting a number of their neighbors to contribute to it. Um, build enough so we can create a fund and start making grants out of it. We manage the underlying assets, the income from the fund, the investments goes out in grants. And there's a committee of Claremont residents who sit down and decide every year, okay, where should these grants go to? So that's one way it happens. We have something called a donor advised fund where the family sets up the fund or an individual and they get to decide um, which grants go to which organizations. They make a recommendation because it's actually our asset once the asset has come to us. But as long as it's a qualified nonprofit, not contrary to our purpose as, an, as a foundation, we make the grant on their behalf. We have scholarships. We have about 100 scholarship committees in the state, um, usually made up with a few members of the local school and some local committee members. So those scholarship funds Students apply through one portal. If there's 10 applications for a scholarship fund, let's say for Keene High, those local people who know the community best choose which students get them. So it's like crowdsourcing philanthropy, not concentrating it into you know, one small staff and a, and a board of directors. Yes. Can you describe the organization, shape of it, how many people? Sure. Um, so we have uh, about 55 staff. We are governed by a board of directors. We are a nonprofit, just like the nonprofits we support, a, a tax-exempt charitable organization. Um, governed by a board of directors, 55 staff, um, on annual operating budget of about $10 million, and a combined total assets of roughly $1 billion, which grows through contributions and performance in the market um, over time, and it's out of those invested assets that we then make the grants and the scholarships. Yes, speak up so we hear you, Laura. 
Um, so if a person or a group is in need and isn't thriving and they don't know where to start, what's the best way to get in contact with your foundation to get that process rolling? Could you um, the question? Yeah, so the question was if a person, need, if an organization, we don't fund individuals, it's an important, but we do fund uh, organizations. Organization doing good work, has a financial need, um, nhcf.org, and then go right to the uh, part of the website that says, are you seeking a grant? <laughs> and click there. We have multiple grant programs, and because it's, it's this concept of community philanthropy um, and all of these funds. These funds, by the way, 2,300, range in size from $10,000 to over $100 million. And they range in size and uh, purpose of all sorts of different purpose. The Sats House wanted to set up a fund for the people of Claremont. Other people have set up a fund for the environment or for arts or for education. Um, we do a lot, as you can imagine, from what I'm talking about, to try to increase access to opportunity so economic mobility is more equitable and available in New Hampshire. So we have a variety of different grant programs, some of which require applications and some don't. I want to tell one quick story. Uh, one of the funds that is we do the most work with was set up by the Hubbard family of Walpole on the edge of the Monadnock region. Hubbards were chicken farmers for generations. They then figured out a very clever way to grow the exact right chickens for pharmaceutical research. And Oliver Hubbard in, um, in the late 1990s, Oliver Hubbard was really um, bothered by the growth of alcoholism and drug addiction, especially in young people in the Monadnock region and broader. And he said, can you at the foundation help us do something about this? He set up a fund of $40 million um, which we have been using now for 25 years to help with the prevention, treatment, and recovery of people suffering from alcoholism and, and, and other drug addiction. And that was a classic case. The Hubbards come into us and say, here's a problem, can we do something together? So there's a specific application process for that, which is why I told that story. We have time for anything online, Ed? I have a question. Yes, um, Nancy. So you have all this money. Who holds your money? Um, like Bar Harbor, Wealth Management, oh, or got it. Work? Great question. So um, we have internally a chief investment officer. We have an investment committee, um, which is partly made up of members of our board of directors and partly investment experts. Um, we have a um, investment consultant, Cambridge Associates, which um, helps institutions all over the world manage their endowments. But to your specific question, um, based on the asset allocation and the investment strategy, we seek and hire effective managers. We have roughly 70 different managers uh, managing different parts of the portfolio um, obviously large equity managers, small equity managers, fixed income, and so forth. A really important part, I'm glad you asked this, Nancy, because what we have always made sure that our investments where possible are invested in things that actually then also help some of the social and environmental work that we're doing. Um, our board made a commitment two years ago that in the coming years we will make sure that we align all of our investment strategies with community need, so the kind of things we're investing in are not contrary to what we're trying to accomplish in our work. And we now have, um, we have three big investment pools. It's fascinating. The second of those is a sustainable impact pool where it's investing in positive things like green energy and low-income housing and things like that is performing at top level of the indexes of those assets that don't have that kind of a focus. So it's a really exciting part of generally an endowment um, management in the country. Might have been more than you asked for, but. <laughs> uh, yes. What, what, what is the advantage to the donor to give you money to, to distribute? There are a couple. Great question. Um, one thing I want to say question. is, 
Oh, sorry. What is the advantage to a donor to working through the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation? So first of all is there's no wrong way to give to nonprofits. Give to nonprofits however you can, however amount, with your credit card, with your check, with your cash, give to nonprofits. We, um, donors come to us for a number of reasons. One, they might have had a liquidity event. And it could be inheritance, sale of a business, sale of a home. And frankly, it might be tax advantageous to make a larger than usual charitable contribution. But rather than say, I'm gonna give my alma mater 10 times what I usually give them this year, they say, hmm, set up a fund with the foundation, get the tax advantage for that, get your tax deduction, and then you can think in the coming years on how you want that. Secondly, is to simplify giving. We have donors who come to us and say, I'm writing 50 and 60 checks a year um, at a fund of the foundation. They, uh, they don't have to do that anymore. Those, we handle all of, all of the, the grant making. And finally, it's legacy. It is, this is the kind of charitable giving we've been doing. We want to make sure that continues as part of our estate planning. So, um, Dan, can you stand up so we can all hear you? It's possible. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's possible. Um, I really enjoyed what you're doing. And I, I, as an architect who's totally focused on building community, I was glad you didn't show any buildings. <laughs> it shows how broad the efforts are to build community. Um, if you look at this, much of New Hampshire, you can look at, some communities fall into a uh, category of a lot of self-pride, and others don't have a whole lot of self-pride. And I'm curious how you see, um, I'm gonna sit down now, uh, how you see uh, the evolution of self-pride happening from all the efforts and focus on community building. You know, it, I added up recently. I lived in ten, I've lived in ten towns in New Hampshire over the last, you know, um, more decades than I care to think. But it changes. I've been in towns where there's there's I'm not sure there's the lack of pride, but where the community doesn't seem to have a common sense of purpose for three or four years, and then something happens. There is a common purpose. There is something. There's been a fire. The town hall needs to be repaired. There's an effort to save a cherished farm, and the community comes together. It's, I think that in every instance I can think of, it's the old Margaret Mead quote, never doubt that a small committed group of citizens can accomplish marvels. It's the only thing that ever has. It's partly that, and I'm gonna go back to my central theme, I can't think of many instances where a town has turned around its fortunes, turned around its self-pride, um, sat up straighter in thinking about its sense of place and community where there wasn't nonprofit organizations in the middle of making that happen. I just cannot overstate how critical, and what happens in our state a lot, when I say every family gets touched every day, a lot of people don't even know it. People don't know the Park Theater is a nonprofit. People don't know the Harris Center for Conservation Education is a nonprofit. People don't know that home, home health care and hospice is a nonprofit organization. People don't know that Southwestern Community Services, that serves thousands of families every day, is a nonprofit organization. They assume this is government. It's not. These are nonprofit organizations, sometimes using government and, and using government contracts and governing funds, but they are of these communities and, and holding our communities together. So if it's self-pride or whether it's economic prosperity or education to access or childcare, generally you're gonna find a nonprofit at the center of those stories. Virginia. Um, it's so touching that you know, you're beginning in the, on the land with the tent. And I'm a transplanted Californian and I have been struck by the incredible riches that New Hampshire has musically. That's my discipline. And of course, McDowell is probably America's most famous classical composer, and then there's Amy Beach. 
And it's interested me that also there are five, and have been, arts communities, St. Gaudens, McDowell, Pennsylvania, Dublin, and I think the fifth one I forgot. Anyway, why is that? Why, and I, I asked myself that question, and I wanted to make a documentary, and then the man I did the beach film with, he went and died on me, and so I just sort of lost my, uh, but I think it's a very interesting construct is it the mountain? Is it the land? It, you know, and, and you are a bit of an expert because you're, you're sort of at the peak of, you know, of what's happening in the state. Because I can tell you as a Westerner growing up, you, you, nobody really learns how individual Vermont, New Hampshire, yeah. Maine are. It's so all lumped together. the question together. is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're almost out of time. So, um, why is New Hampshire so blessed in, you know, in, in is it the culture, the culture or I, it's yeah. very interesting, isn't it? You know, it? I honestly, Virginia, I honestly don't know, and I've been curious about it for a long time. Um, there are some organizations I really value who explore this. So the New, Ham New, the New Hampshire Humanities Council, right. nonprofit organization, um, they have so many programs around the impact of music and, and, and visual arts and performing arts and film. Um, I, as a writer, I can tell you that I think New Hampshire has more incredibly talented writers per capita kind of hidden away in the hills and the woods and the, and the communities than states where I have friends who are also writers. I think of uh, artists like Mary Islin who you know, is it, if it, is it because people are closely connected to the land? One thing we actually don't do in the state very well is public support for art. So maybe that's partly so smaller nonprofit organizations, communities kind of really step up. I mean, you're going to hear from Kate McNally. You know, the center of the contra dancing world is Nelson, New Hampshire. I mean, who would have thunk it, right? And so it just, it, yeah, it's, I, I'm really curious about this. I'm going to do one final plug, too. If you haven't yet seen uh, The Mountain That Stands Alone, because it talks about that. It talks about how artists and writers and Thoreau and Twain and Emerson were a part of the efforts to save Mount Monadnock. That is true of the White Mountains as well. The White Mountain School of Art was one of the major reasons that the White Mountain National Forest became the first Eastern National Forest in America. And the whole Eastern National Forest system started here in New Hampshire because a small group of citizens were watching the mountains get overlogged and burned down at the turn of the century and wanted to do something about it. And they were inspired by art. Well. Yay! Well, thank you. Well, <laughs> March 1, Kate McNally. Please mark your calendars. Have all your friends mark their calendars. And uh, stay. Join us for the reception. And once again, thank you very, very much. <laughs> As, as most of you know, David Beltet is the president of the Jaffe Civic Center. David. Okay, I want to thank you for coming. I really struck a chord listening to you today. On behalf of us, I'd like to give you this token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you. Mostly things you can probably like very much. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, I'd like to thank you very much, executive producer of this program. I, I only see it that every month after month the momentum that we're gaining and the subjects we talk about are very relevant in our communities and I appreciate your efforts to put this thing together.